Jackson Beck in the CBS broadcasting booth way up at the top of the great amphitheater of Pompeii. It's Navy Day here in Pompeii, this blistering hot 26th day of August in the year 79. Navy Day and no doubt about it. The mighty Roman fleet fresh from its recent Mediterranean maneuvers is anchored right out here in the Bay of Naples. And every Navy man that could get liberty is jam-packed into this amphitheater. Practically the whole population of Pompeii, 20,000 people, have turned out to honor the watchdogs of the Empire. The mighty Roman fleet commanded by Pliny the Elder. Yes, it's a great day for Pompeii. From my vantage point way up high, I can see this big bowl full of Pompeians spread out before me. And they're having a whale of a time. The games haven't started yet. August 26, up rapidly. 79 A.D., the last day of Pompeii. CBS is there. CBS takes you back 1869 years to a city in the shadow of an epic catastrophe. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. CBS is there. CBS is there, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon, is based on authentic historical facts and quotations. And now, August 26, 79 A.D., the amphitheater in Pompeii and Jackson Beck. Today finds the Roman fleet in Pompeii's backyard. And the Pompeians have been looking forward to this holiday for a long time. The uh, customers are still pouring into the amphitheater with their admission tickets of bone and bronze. The ushers are showing the crowd to their seats, patricians to the ringside seats, the freedmen to the middle section, and the ladies way up in the gallery, especially reserved for them. The uh, big show in the arena here this afternoon, of course, is the fight between the gladiators Pugnax, P-U-G-N-A-X, Pugnax, and Moranus, M-U-R-R-A-N-U-S, that's Pugnax and Moranus. But also on the program is the execution of a family of Nazarenes who will be thrown to the lions. And after that, more contests, games, wild animal hunts, and a whopping big review of the fleet with all hands on deck. To cover these exciting events in Pompeii here today, CBS has special events reporters Ken Roberts down there at the ringside, Michael Fitzmaurice up in the ladies' gallery, <laughs> lucky dog, Cameron Blake at the entrance to the arena, John Daly out in the bay with the fleet, and yours truly, Jackson Beck, perched up here in our CBS observation booth overlooking the whole amphitheater right up near the gods themselves. And speaking of gods, I'll wager most of them are sitting right up on top of old Mount Vesuvius out there, sipping their nectar, savoring their ambrosia, and enjoying the fine spectacle right along with us poor mortals. Yeah. Uh, my calm, cool technician, Philip Airhorn, tells me that Ken Roberts is ready to introduce some of the celebrities who are here today. So we'll switch you to Ken Roberts down there at the ringside. Dais, the seat of honor for our noted guest today, there is the Senator Lavinius Regulus, the former city officials Caius Quirinius Vargas and Marcus Porches, the banker M. Cantrius Marcellus, and of course the Adar Brachilus Proprius, one of the leading magistrates of Pompeii, through whose personal courtesy this spectacle honoring the baby has been arranged. The Adar is very popular with the people. Yes, indeed, Your Honor, Pompeii is one of the most delightful summer resorts in the whole Roman Empire. Of course, it's all the cool winds aren't blowing today. What's wrong? By Jove, it's a marvelous day. All honor to the Roman fleet and to my excellent friend, the Admiral Pliny the Elder. Oh, my good people, would that you were with us on this magnificent occasion. Join with us on this day of joy. Never has Pompeii been so honored. Your Honor, do you think the heat will affect the match between Pugnax and Morenus? Not a bit, not a bit. The heat I vow is most unusual. Certainly all the world has heard of the salubrious, the exhilarating climate of our fair city of Pompeii. Naturally, but what about... Yes, yes, today is very unusual. Statius, noble author, has said, and I quote him, All things conspire to make life pleasant in Pompeii. Where the summers are cool and the winters warm. And where the sea dies away gently as it kisses the shore. Jupiter, that's well said. Don't you think so? I do, Your Honor. And by the truth, I vow, would that every Roman could enjoy our exquisite weather. And I say to all of them, come to Pompeii. Yes, but... Come to the biggest little colony in the Roman Empire. Yes, Your Honor. Enjoy our entertainment, our baths. They are without equal. But, Your Honor, what about the earthquake that caused so much damage oh, yes, a few years yes, ago? Yes, yes, most unusual. But we are rebuilding. By Jove, that earthquake was truly a blessing to the gods, I say. For upon the old, we are setting up the news. Come, come, every 
one come and live life to its fullest among the pleasures of Pompeii. I love you all. Your Honor, whom do you favor in the main contest this afternoon, Pugnax or Morena? Uh, as sponsor of the event, it would be injudicious for me to take five. Oh, uh, but by Jupiter, I do favor Morena's. And I've placed a small wager with the senator on the goal. But I'm impartial. May the strongest man win. Thank you, Pastor Thank, Thank you. Another well-known personality on the day is the famous comedian and buffoon, Horconius Rufus. Rufus, who is that divine goddess who accompanied you into the amphitheater? By my trust, that is no divine goddess. That is she to whom I am wedded. <laughs> the title of the performance you're now giving at the theater. Why, uh, we are doing Pap the Doctor Thrown Out. Ah, uh, but today is a Roman holiday. Today we do not wear the mask and wig. Ah, uh, but, uh, uh, no talk of the theater now. Let us enjoy this wonderful spectacle. And in truth, I am so glad to be here. Really, I'm awfully glad to be here. You know, <laughs> a most curious event occurred to me on my way to the amphitheater today. Really? Would you tell us about it? I'd be very glad to tell you about it. <laughs> I was being carried in my litter past the forum. Forum? That's another name for a meeting of my wife's dear family conferring on the problem of how to squander my wealth. <laughs> I was being carried past the forum, going, and there, and there I saw this unusual spectacle. It seems that a slave was carrying an umbrella for his master. Suddenly, the slave stopped walking, and his master continued on out from under the umbrella, and by the gods, he did not get wet. No? <laughs> no, for by Jupiter, for the uh, 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 it wasn't raining. <laughs> Tell me, Rufus, are you wagering on today's contest? Oh, for sure, I am, Burley, I am. I, uh, I shall wager two talents on Partnax and two talents on Marina. <laughs> but that way you'll only break even. The confirmation department should be wished, for indeed I can use the money. I say now, who will take these wages? You, Your Honor. What you say? Thank you, Hulkoni Rufus. The purpose of your talent now is in the entrance of the gladiators in the arena. For a description of the possession of gladiators who return you to Jackson Beck up at the top of the amphitheater. The procession is about to enter the arena from the north portal. I can see the musicians, and behind them, here they come, the gladiators, unarmed, marching in solemn, stately tread into the arena. The crowd is hypnotized by the sight of these men marching slowly to what will certainly be death for many in the ranks. The faces of the gladiators set in expressions that range from almost inhuman ferocity to other stoicism. In contrast, the bloodlust of the spectators has charged their faces with almost livid anticipation. All eyes, of course, are on Fudnax and Marina. Fudnax looks surprisingly young. His body is well-muscled, but not brawny. He looks as lithe as a panther. Marina, on the other hand, is a picture of savage brutality. His body is covered with hair, and his arms hang from his sides like, like battle axes. Behind the gladiators, a chariot is bringing up the end of the procession, and chained to the sides of the chariot is that Nazarene family that will be thrown to the lions. There are three of them, father, mother, and daughter. The daughter, a girl of about 15. The Nazarenes, you know, are that peculiar sect which of late has been causing so much unrest in the empire since their leader was executed in the Palestine colony by authority of Pontius Pilate. This particular family is well known in Pompeii. The father, Marcus Tullius, was formerly a member of the priesthood of Isis. The uh, prisoners are marching with their heads thrown high, faces that reflect a strange, mystical kind of ecstasy. And now the gladiators have reached the diet. procession is starting its march back out of the arena, which is fairly large, measuring about 400 feet in length and 300 in width. And now Mike Fitzmaurice is waiting to interview another celebrity down in the ladies' gallery. So let's go down there and see who it is. Here at our 
our CBS microphone with me is one of the most beautiful and famous women in all the empire. Angel. A favorite of the emperor, the celebrated entertainer, the delightful Umbrizia Januaria. Januaria, what brings you from Rome to Pompeii? The heat by Lucifer is murderous in Rome. Ah. Huh? Like a baker's oven, but Pompeii is worse. It is like Hades, but no matter. I would travel through Brimstone to the ends of the empire to watch Morena's battle. Magnificent, magnificent Morena. You're staying here at your villa, of course. Hardly a villa, Angel. Nearly 15 chambers in an atrium and a parasol of only 84 columns. Just a modest little place but away from the city. When will this contest begin? It's simply stifling in this gallery, and these women, they smell abundantly of the farm. Gloria, move that fan faster, girl. Move it, move it. I, uh, know oh. you're wearing your hair up this summer, January. Is that the latest fashion in Rome? Yes, the Empress style. Do you approve? It's very attractive with the ringlets piled high on the head that way. Angel. By the way, how is the Empress? Lovely. She gets more beautiful as she grows older. So I hear it. I see you're wearing your robe in stola fashion, almost to the ground. Yes, do you like the sandals? They're more popular than booties this year among the better class of women. Sorry, I moved that fan faster. I'll jab you with this hairpin. Necklaces, rings, bracelets, and the earrings of worked gold are also being worn. That's very interesting. Mm. Uh, who do you like in the big contest today, January? Pognac uh, or Morena? Morena. By Apollo, there is a man. Muscles like granite boulders. Have you seen him fight before? Ah, uh, and then he does. Nobody lunges a triton into his opponent's belly more magnificently than he. I remember the last time he fought. It was against the Saxon. Why he cured him with the agility of a fawn dancing on a buttercup. The man is a veritable mountain of the studio. Thank you, Umbrizia January. Now over to Ken Roberts, who has moved from the days to the Freedman section. Standing beside me in the freeze man section is one of those famous gladiators of all time. A man whose name and glorious career is known to all of you. A man who really needs no introduction. The champion of champions, one of the few gladiators ever to retire undefeated from the list. A former slave but discharged with honor. A now freed man and a Roman citizen. The quietity is the Macedonian. <laughs> well, what have you been doing since your retirement, the quietity? Oh, I've become an innkeeper. My inn is at the sign of the wild dog. At the Herculaneum Gate. I hope I have a very fine end. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Who is your favorite today, Pugnax or Morena? Uh, both are names, I vow. Well, they don't compare with the gladiators of your time? Why, well, Zeus, in my time, they would not be fed to the lions. In the good old days. Thank you, the gladiators. The trumpets are sounding. The big fight is ready to start. So over to Jackson Beck in the observation booth for a blow by blow description of this great contest. Now the fighters have reached the large ring drawn on the floor of the arena by the ringmaster. They must battle within the confines of that circle. Now they're in the circle. The battle has begun. The sense of expectancy has come over the crowd. All eyes are on the combatants. The two fighters are circling, measuring each other. Torch is careful. Morena has taken up a position in the center of the circle. Pugnax slowly walking around him. Neither fighters yet made a move. Pugnax plunges to the sword, but Morena steps aside with the agility of a deer. Pugnax quickly recovers. His eyes never moving from that metal. His opponent's right hand. They circle again. is the next event. The Lions will be led into the arena in a moment, so over to Cameron Blake at the arena entrance. The Lions are being let out of their cages now. 
They're in the cage door. It's being opened. Here come the lions. They're passing through a barred passageway into the arena. There are eight lions. These beasts have been starved for 48 hours. They are hungry, vicious, panting for the taste of flesh. Here come the Nazarenes from the dungeon. Marcus Tullius, his wife and daughter. They're practically naked. The guards are bringing them up. Marcus holds his wife's hand in his own as if to give her strength and courage. The woman is leaning on her daughter, a beautiful child of 15. They're accompanying each other. Uh, Marcus Tullius, will you speak to us? I will pray for you, my son. This is a bitter end for a former priest of Isis. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I fought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Are you quoting the words of your leader? These are the words of Paul, of sacred memory. It was he who converted us in Rome. It was he who... Trumpets are sounding. The guards are pushing the three Nazarenes into the arena. They're trying to embrace the mother of faith and courageous. He does not weep. Daughter and husband support her. The old man is praying aloud. They're brave, these Nazarenes. Here comes the iron gate, closing the way into the arena. There is no escape for them now. Back to Jackson Beck in the observation booth. The Nazarenes are alone in the arena now with the lions. They're standing together. The lips are moving in prayer. Now the animals have sighted them. They're bounding forward. They're ready. Well, that. CBS in Rome. The special Navy Day broadcast from Pompeii this 26th of August in the year 79 has been interrupted because of transmission difficulties. Just before the failure occurred, Jackson Beck reported from the amphitheater that Mount Vesuvius, just outside the city of Pompeii, had suddenly exploded. We are trying to reestablish contact with Pompeii. Meanwhile, we invite you to listen to one of the Emperor Titus's favorite singers, Marcia Campania, singing Be Love the Pearl. <laughs> received word this 26th of August in the year 79 from Naples, confirming the fact that Mount Vesuvius has erupted and Pompeii, the most beautiful resort city in this time of the Caesars, is on fire. One moment, please. Uh, another report has just been handed to me. The town of Herculaneum, eight miles west of Pompeii and on the western slope of Vesuvius, has also been inundated with a flood of fiery mud. CBS will do its best to provide the fullest possible coverage of this sudden and completely unexpected catastrophe this 26th day of August in the year 79, the first year of the reign of the Emperor Titus. Fortunately, we were broadcasting from Pompeii when Vesuvius exploded. Our CBS mobile unit was at the amphitheater, and we may be able to reestablish contact with it again. John Daly, aboard the fleet in the Bay of Naples, is equipped with a shortwave transmitter and... Just a moment. I have just been informed that John Daly is ready to broadcast from the Roman Imperial Fleet. So over to John Daly. This is John 
Davy on the deck. That will finish flag 50. Augustus Rex Vesuvius has exploded. Pompey has disappeared under an inferno of flaming rock and a hail of scalding fiery steam. We can't see anything but flame and smoke rising above shattered Pompeii. The crew of the Admiral's ship have begun to launch barges to head for Pompeii to rescue any inhabitants that may reach the beaches. The Admiral himself has gone ashore, and I hope to be able to board one of the barges with my shortwave equipment shortly and get to the beach. The terrible catastrophe came without warning to us on the fleet out here in the bay. It was just past noon Roman time. As you heard the broadcast of the gladiatorial contest, we out here heard a terrific roar. We all turned to look and saw Vesuvius on fire. A tremendous column of smoke was shooting up from the summit. A cloud-like mass that burst upwards and outwards like a huge pine tree. It burned fiery red in spots, and in other spots it was black, blue, violet, all the colors of the rainbow, huge chunks of rock and earth were tossed about in the air like pebbles, and everywhere a torrent of blazing embers was flying off into space. For a few seconds, this entire ghastly mass seemed suspended in the sky, and then, like a fiery blanket, it fell upon Pompeii and nearby Herculaneum. Wait just a moment. The barge on, barge on which I'm going ashore is ready. I'll try to get back on the air when I reach the beach. This is John Daly. I return you to CBS Row. This is Harry Marble in Rome, this August 26th in the year 79. Our CBS mobile unit, which was at the amphitheater in Pompeii, broadcasting the Navy Day spectacle when Mount Vesuvius erupted, has succeeded in re-establishing contact. So we switch you now to Jackson Beck, somewhere in Pompeii. This is Jackson Beck. This is Jackson Beck. I hope I'm getting through. I'm in the partly soundproof CBS mobile unit moving slowly along Stavian Street, passing the new temple of Jupiter. You can probably hear the sound of the unit wheels and the steady thump thump of cinders, rock, and flaming ash on the top. Outside, through the windows, I can see people screaming and shouting. Buildings are burning and crashing in flames. Ann Roberts is in the mobile unit with me. So is Mike McCarrick. But we don't know what has become of Cameron Flake. We lost track of him when the panic started at the gladiatorial combat. We're making our way as fast as we can through the beaches, but the going is slow, torturously slow. The roads are jammed with thousands of escaping men, women, and children. They're all trying to get in here with us. It's thick black outside, almost like night. Some people are carrying torches. By their eerie lights, the horrified faces on the road are silhouetted with dark, wild fears. This is the first tragedy in the reign of the Roman Emperor Titus. We were drowned only two months ago. The smoke is intense. Most people have thrown their tunics over their heads and are trying to crawl as close to the ground as possible, trying to get under the murk. The smoke. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's down on the roof of our mobile unit. Yes. As I can see it now, it's rain. Rain. It's beginning to rain. The rain is mixing with the ashes and embers. The road outside is becoming a hissing, scalding, searing, flaming inferno. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> the steam and smoke is leaking through. It's up there, but hot. <laughs> I can't talk. I can't sit. Perhaps Ted Roberts will fish. So they're coughing too. Waving their hands. <laughs> oh, we can't continue. I can't. I return you to CBS Rome. CBS Rome. This is Harry Marble in Rome. A report from Mycenaeum says that the estimated deaths are at least 2,000. The Admiral of the Fleet, Pliny the Elder, is missing. Our reporter, Cameron Blake, has succeeded in re-establishing contact. Go ahead, Cameron Blake. This is Cameron Blake. I'm in a room filled with people who have sought refuge from the steady falling downpour of flaming ash, which is continuing to pour from the angry open mouth of Vesuvius and is swiftly reducing this once beautiful summer colony of Pompeii to smoking ruins. This looks like the last day of Pompeii. The Pompeians are almost insensible with fear. Those of us here escaped the amphitheater through a side entrance to the dungeons where the lions were kept. As we ran through the streets, we stumbled over the dead and the dying. The scene was a holocaust. There was a madness about it all. 
A rich merchant stumbling along with whatever treasures he could salvage from his wrecked and burning house, beads and baubles around his neck, money bags clutched to his waist. Behind him, his slaves carried a smoldering litter. We passed the young boy and girl clutched tightly together, oh, dead. Come to get out of the roof is on fire. I'd better get out of here fast. This is Harry Marble again. The signal from Pompeii has failed. We have only one last recourse now for any news from the burning city, and that is John Daly reporting from the beach by way of the Navy transmitter aboard the fleet. Go ahead, John Daly. Listening to the last day of Pompeii, another broadcast in the series CBS is There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Sheehan. The last day of Pompeii was written by Irv Tunick. Next week, June 22nd, 1757, Clive of India wins the Battle of Plassey. CBS is There. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week for Columbia Broadcasting Systems.